Thank you and welcome to the January 3rd Dr. Cog board work session. I'm Wynn Shaw, Vice Chair of Dr. Cog and the Chair of today's board work session. Happy New Year to everyone. It is 4 p.m. and our meeting is now in order. I would first like to welcome uh, new members to the Dr. Cog board. Terrence Kelly from the City of Sheridan. And we have three new alternates, Justin Martinez, City of Thornton, Tara Biter fleur City of Sheridan, and I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, uh, and Aaron Rodriguez, City of Longmont. So welcome to everyone. The first business in order is to open the period for public comment. Melinda, do you see any hands raised for public comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we can give it just a moment. And it looks like at this time, I do not see any hands raised for public comment. Thank you so much. Uh, with no one here for public comment, we will close the period for public comment. Uh, our next business in order is the summary of the board uh, work session from November 1st. Are there questions or changes? Seeing no hands raised, uh, the summary will be accepted as distributed. The next business in order is a discussion on the Regional Housing Needs Assessment. I will recognize Sheila Lynch, the Division Director for Regional Planning and Development to introduce the presentation team. Sheila? Great, thank you so much, Chair Shaw. And happy new year to all of you. Um, also hello to our new board members and to our colleagues and members of the public who may be listening in. Um, thank you for allowing us to take some time today to provide the first update from the Regional Housing Needs Assessment. As many of you know, we embarked on the Regional Housing Needs Assessment in late September, and this is our first update for you, the Dr. Cog Board. Um, we want to be sure to keep you all informed as we walk through this process that we intend to go. This process will take us through to June 2024. I know it's hard to believe. I keep saying 2024. I can't believe we're already here. Um, and our goal for this evening is to review a bit about our engagement approach for the Regional Housing needs assessment, to share the methodology and preliminary analysis around housing need, um, to give you an idea of what's going to come next, what we have coming in the coming months. And lastly, and most importantly, we want to provide an opportunity for you to ask questions and to discuss some of our early deliverables or early findings of this assessment. So it is my pleasure to introduce our consultant team who are assisting Dr. Cog in this effort. Um, Echo Northwest is our lead consultant and Tyler Bump and Leanne Ryan are here from Echo Northwest. And um, CUNY Planning Collaborative, uh, David Driscoll is here from that consulting firm as well. So thank you all for joining us and we look forward to hearing all that you have to share. I think I'm passing it on to David at this point. I think actually Tyler is gonna give us a quick okay. kickoff. Yeah. Great. I'll give a quick intro before Leanne uh, shares the slides. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tyler Bump. I'm a partner project director at Echo Northwest and feel very fortunate to work with the Dr. Cog team and the sort of stakeholder community across the Dr. Cog region on this really important work. Um, we're the lead consultant on this work. Um, as Sheila mentioned, David from Community Planning Collaborative and we also have MIG who's supporting on engagement and helping us with some graphics on the work as well um, as part of our team. My colleague Leanne is a project manager. She's gonna be sharing the screen, capturing some of the questions in the chat to make sure that we capture those uh, for the conversation today. Um, and we're excited to share the, the our work to date with you and our progress and for the conversation. So David, I'll kick it back over to you. Okay, Leanne, well, yeah, let's get the slides rolling. So we're going to go through about a 45 minute presentation. Um, I'm gonna be facilitating during the presentation part, then we're gonna be handing it back to uh, Chair Shaw to, to facilitate the group conversation around this. We're excited to be here and to uh, will share the information and hear your questions and thoughts and feedback. We can go to the agenda slide, Leanne. 
we've got a number of things we want to talk through. Um, I'm not seeing this slide. There we go. Um, we're going to start off with a brief presentation from Sheila. She's going to talk a little bit about Dr. Cole's, uh, Dr. Cog's work in this space and sort of uh, thinking about housing um, and also some of the lessons they've learned talking to other councils of government around the country that have been doing this kind of work. I'm going to give a quick update on the engagement that's been going on in conjunction with the analysis. And then the bulk of the session today is hearing from Tyler uh, the summary of the approach to the assessment, the methodology that's been used, and most importantly, the preliminary results, and some discussion around uh, the role of subregions and thinking about potential local goals related to housing. Um, so that's where we're going to be going. We're going to pause a couple times during the course of the presentation to hear any clarifying questions you have. Uh, I think you're pretty comfortable in this space now to use your virtual raising of hands, or you can also use the chat if there's a question that comes to mind as it slides up and we can then respond to those. If we can't get to all the questions, we'll follow up with responses. Um, but again, those will be focused on clarifying questions. And then afterwards, we're looking forward to the discussion and hearing your thoughts. Um, and I think that's all for me. I'm gonna pass it to Sheila to get us started with the content. Great. Thank you so much, David. So um, we thought it might be helpful to just share a, a little bit of background on how Dr. Cog got to this point of la launching a regional housing needs assessment. Um, some of this information I know I've shared at the board before, but because there's several new board members, we thought this might be helpful to just ground us in some of this information again. Um, so I don't need to go over the purpose and roles of Dr. Cog with all of you, um, but I wanted to point out that this regional housing needs assessment work is very much rooted in the approach that Dr. Cog takes with all of our work in transportation and mobility, in um, aging and, and disability resources, and also in our role around growth and development in that um, Dr. Cog really sees ourselves as a convener across the region, and we will use that role in this process to bring people together to have conversations around how do we address the housing needs across our region. Um, we always take a collaborative model to our approach, meaning that we know that no one entity can solve this um, housing challenge on their own. And so we're always looking at what does this collaboration look like in order to really reach some results. And we uh, often see ourselves as great problem solvers in that um, we, we are often taking on and tackling um, some big issues across the region and always come to the table on a solution oriented approach. So that is the approach we're taking with our regional housing needs assessment as well. So the critical regional planning component of ensuring that there are diverse housing options that meet the needs of all residents is embedded in our regional plan, which is called Metro Vision. In the last update of Metro Vision, which was adopted unanimously by the Dr. Cogs board in 2019, the incorporation of housing objectives was a very intentional piece to that. At the time, the role and the methods for how we might collaborate around housing discussions may not have been clear, but it was clear that the importance of integrating housing into the work that we do at the regional level is very important. So the model that we use for MetroVision implementation, we often say it reflects a collective impact model in that we recognize that the actions and the efforts that are taken at the local, even neighborhood level, are critical for moving the needle on the plan's um, desired outcomes. And when appropriate, regionally coordinated and aligned efforts will also move us closer to the vision that we have articulated in our regional plan, Metro Vision. So we know that local work is well underway. 
that we know that many of our member governments are already busy doing housing assess assessments and plans. The um, Innovative Affordable Housing Strategy Program that came out of House Bill 21-1271 has provided uh, really well-needed funding to do this assessment work. Um, I'm excited to share that 41 of, of the communities across the region have submit, are submitted their commitment filing for Proposition 123 program back in November. So there's a lot of commitment to leveraging that resources at, as well at the local level. And we've also seen many communities embrace different policy efforts at the local level to address housing. I believe the count on how many communities are, have considered inclusionary housing ordinances, which is just one of many local policy strategies. I think last that we counted, um, I think it was about seven communities across the region. So this map shows, we created this map back in May to try to get an, a sense of how many communities just in the last two years have taken on some sort of assessment or housing plan. And so this shows those communities. This, this map is from May of 2023, and we know there are communities that have started since then. So we apologize if you don't see your community on the map, but more just to emphasize, we know there is really great recent housing assessment and planning work underway. So another part of why we're here is due to a reassessment at the federal level. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill of 2021, in addition to unlocking tremendous funding for transportation, climate, and broadband, it updated and launched a new dimension of transportation planning by incorporating housing into the planning factors that metropolitan planning organizations must consider as they conduct their regional transportation planning efforts. With that said, at Dr. Cog, we've been considering housing for quite some time. We are not we are not conducting our transportation planning work in isolation. We are often integrating different topics related to to our, our that are important to our region. But this uh, this effort actually opened up an opportunity to actually leverage transportation planning funding to incorporate or consider housing in that effort. So when when the board, um, when Dr. Cog board first said that that we should be considering housing and perhaps considering an assessment, we actually um, did some work. Staff did some work to talk to other regions across across the country. Most of the conversations we had, these stakeholder conversations, were with peer organizations, so organizations like Dr. Cog and other regions. Some of them were with organizations that may be more at the county level, but these were areas that, that along the way people identified had taken on some sort of housing work, housing assessment or housing planning work. And so we had conversations with them to understand kind of how they approached it, what, what were some of the challenges, what should we be considering as we launch our work. And they shared a lot of rich information, but just to summarize some of the key takeaways, one of the things we heard is that the unique context, context and circumstances of the Denver region are really important. And we need to, while we learn from other regions, we need to keep that in mind as we move forward in this work. We're being very intentional about taking time to understand the problem before we launch into solutions. I know it's kind of launching as we go because there's so much discussion underway, but trying to be strategic about how we address this because we know that it'll be hard to prioritize resources if we don't, and also hard to measure our progress if, we're, if we don't take some time to understand the problem first. There's a lot of housing assessment, as I mentioned, underway at the local level. The regional context is important as well to understand how, how at the regional level, how is housing need really generated? Where does that come from? And because we know that it doesn't stop at any particular border. But what we do know is coordination across the local and the regional efforts is really key. 
And at Dr. Cog, we know the importance of partnerships. And that's why with this work, we have already engaged many, many organizations, our member governments, and also our advisory group re represents many different organizations that we know are going to be key collaborators as we move forward. And our intention is not to simply study the problem, that we fully intend to keep moving to, to help facilitate those conversations to lead us into implement, implementation. So I just wanted to stress that we are currently in the regional housing needs assessment period, and we anticipate this going until about June of 2024. Our intention then is to, to launch into a more strategy development to, to really create those solutions. What are we gonna work on together to address these um, housing challenges? And we anticipate that work starting this, this summer in 2024. We have been very intentional to make sure that we continue to engage our member governments throughout the process and our partners that are critical to moving this work forward. And we're mindful that while good assessment and planning takes time, there are timelines already underway to have these discussions at different levels, namely at the state legislation, um, at the state legislators um, are already taking on this, this topic. And so we wanna make sure that whatever information and data we're pulling from this process, we're making sure that's available and ready to, in order to inform those conversations as well. One of the things that we, we're very intentional about as we selected a consultant team is to understand the experience that they've had in leading different groups and regions through this process. And so we know that there are a lot of lessons to be learned from other parts of the country, both things that we should maybe replicate and things that maybe we should steer away from. And so um, David and Tyler are gonna help us learn more about that as well this evening. All right, David, I'll jump in and start to talk about first about the Puget Sound uh, Regional Council Vision 2050 and some of their housing planning they've been doing for a long time. Um, the Puget Sound Regional Council is the Seattle region, uh, regional government, very similar in function to Dr. Cog. Similar to Dr. Cog, they've been doing um, transportation planning while integrating housing uh, for a long time and really thinking about housing targets over the last 10 to 15 years related to transportation and transit investments across the region, similar to the way that Dr. Cog has as well with the population forecast and thinking about transportation planning. Um, about four years ago, PSRC started a process uh, with their own regional housing strategy um, that was published in 2021 um, and the regional housing needs assessment is part of that. The reason that I think it's really interesting is because there were also state level conversations at the legislature happening uh, during that development of that process around um, uh, setting legislation for local jurisdictions to determine housing need as part of their long range planning and growth management act requirements in the state of Washington. Um, so PSRC in a similar way of Dr. Cog was a little bit ahead of the, the curve um, in helping to inform those state level conversations and be a um, a supportive resource to jurisdictions across the region and understanding their needs in relation to the ongoing conversations of, of the legislature in that year. Um, the Washington legislature adopted uh, House Bill 1220 in 2022, which requires jurisdictions in Washington to do a housing needs assessment and identify what those housing needs are by income category and plan for land capacity within their housing elements of their comprehensive plans which is one of the first sort of big statewide growth management updates um, on housing for a long time in Washington. Um, and so this work that PSRC was doing at a regional level and supporting the local jurisdictions was really helpful um, and having those jurisdictions have that, that support. The, the state also in a similar way to the state of Colorado providing IHOP grant funding for some of these needs assessments provided funding to local jurisdictions to do their work, uh, housing needs assessment and housing action plans at the same time. So there's a lot of similarities in between what um, the Denver region has is going through and going through this policy, state level policy conversations and figuring out the regional role and local roles and how to support jurisdictions and member governments throughout the region. Um, the other uh, regional housing plan that we've been working on recently, this we finished this up in 2023, is for the Compass Regional Government in Boise, Idaho. So this is Ada County and Canyon County in Idaho. 
this was the first time that their regional government as an MPO that predominantly does transportation planning really started to think about housing. And some of the key um, sort of lessons learned from this work is that both the jurisdictions and the regional government saw a lot of benefit in um, having a convened conversation at the region about housing and sort of coming to a consensus across the region that housing affordability is a challenge in the Boise region, in the Compass region, um, and then creating the opportunity in the space with Compass as that sort of convener of an organization and reaffirming that convener role for Compass to be able to facilitate those conversations with the region, uh, regional governments. The other piece that was really interesting is that we developed a um, web-based tool uh, that identifies a lot of the trends, housing needs, all the data points that all of the jurisdictions within the Compass region would need to do their own local housing needs assessment, have common data sources come at it with the same information so that they're all working from the same place. And that was an extremely, extremely valuable tool for them to have that consistency in data, the same years of the data, the same forecast year, to know that they're working uh, with the same information and making policy decisions that are sensitive to the context, the political context, the policy context, the cultural, physical conditions that are sensitive, that are specific to those communities with having that same information. Um, and then again, sort of reaffirming that the role of the regional government to be the host and the convener of these conversations of regional housing policy and to be that place where um, jurisdictions and, and, and governments can go to uh, for resources, for tools to help facilitate that um, for those local governments tools so that there's availability of tools for those jurisdictions that they can choose that meet the context of their own communities. Um, they're brand new to it. They're just starting to go through it, but it was a really, really uh, helpful process uh, in, in Boise as well. We've done this work, as Sheila mentioned, we do this work all over the place. We're doing a lot of it in Montana now in response to Montana state legislation. Um, we've done it across the Southwest in Pima County and Southern Nevada. Um, and some of the methods that I'll show you later on today when we get to the methodology are really uh, best practice, emerging best practice about how to think about housing needs at a regional level and sort of coordinated regional um, housing housing planning, um, working with jurisdictions that are very different across regions as well. So David, I'll pass it over to you to talk about Plan Bay Area and ABAG a little bit. Yeah. So uh, first, I just want to say I spent eight years in Boulder as planning and sustainability director. So have familiarity with the Denver region, but for the last, I don't know, four years, I've been uh, working on a number of different planning initiatives, housing initiatives, and a lot of that has been focused in the Bay Area. Plan Bay Area 2050 is the equivalent of Dr. Cog's Metro Vision. Um, I'm not going to talk about the housing planning part so much. You may be familiar that the state uh, legislature in California has been a little aggressive in uh, passing a lot of legislation. And what we do a lot of work with the Association of Bay Area Governments, which is the Council of Governments for the San Francisco area, is support local staff in understanding and applying that state law. So we do a ton of technical assistance. And I think ABAG has really been a model for delivering that technical assistance. Understanding they have 109 member jurisdictions, everyone from San Jose, which is a city of over a million people, to small communities of 6,000 people that have one planning staff, and they're all charged with implementing the same state laws. So one thing they've been, done a lot of is doing webinars and creating tools to help um, translate really complicated state law into things that local government staff need to actually implement it, so model ordinances, checklists, things like that. Um, had the pleasure of working with Tyler and folks from Opticos delivering a working group on folks in middle housing. So how do you think about miss, missing middle housing and delivering in your community, understanding the complexity of sort of the market across that larger of an area. Um, and also they've helped set up planning collaboratives at each of the counties. There's nine counties in the Bay Area. Um, they just recently approved new funding that's flowing from the state to the Council of Governments, $500,000 is going to Santa Clara County alone. That's for two years of technical assistance, brings all the planning and housing staff from 16 jurisdictions together on a monthly basis to solve shared problems, to understand the new state laws, to undertake joint projects together. Um, and $500,000 is a good chunk of change, but when you divide it by 16 jurisdictions over two years, you're talking like $15,000 per jurisdiction. And if you tier it based on community size from Mona Serena, which is 6,000 to San Jose, which is a million, 
it's actually not a huge investment that delivers a huge amount of benefit for the local government staff. So I know that's down the road in terms of Dr. Cog conversations, but I, I do think it's something to really think about sort of how do you support staff who are kind of in between a lot of contention around development issues at the local level um, and state laws that are coming, coming down that they're charged with uh, implementing. So I'm gonna move on. Uh, Leanne, if we can go to the next slide, I'm going to give a quick, quick update on the engagement that's been going on, and then we'll take a quick pause to hear any clarifying questions. Um, so Sheila mentioned there's been an advisor group. It's about 40 members. Uh, you can see there sort of the kinds of folks who are on that group, from local government staff to affordable housing developers and others. We've had two meetings so far, um, sharing with them why we're doing this. Uh, sharing with them some of the preliminary results, which you're going to see right after this. Um, and just want to underscore, this is a group that is advisory. It's a kind of a sounding board for the staff and consultant team. They're not making decisions or even formal recommendations, but it's been a, a valuable group for us to have discussions with. The one thing I just want to talk briefly at the first meeting, we, we asked them for what's their definition of success for this. Um, and there's a, a summary that has all of their comments, but uh, some things that stood out is one, they want to make sure this is not just a study, that it actually leads to action. Two, they want to make sure there's not a one size fits all approach in terms of any strategy that comes out of it, understanding the complexity and difference across the region and what different communities need and having sort of a flexible toolkit. Um, and then also th they talked about um, you know, considering the intersection of housing with other issues, other community priorities related to transportation, related to climate, related to community resilience and other issues. So um, it was a really good, uh, interesting conversation for us to hear sort of how they're thinking about this one piece within a larger context of community planning. We go to the next slide. There's also been a couple of uh, focus groups uh, that MIG helped facilitate, put together and facilitate. So one was focused specifically around members of local government staff, so from planning and housing, and land use. And the other group was uh, folks involved in climate and sustainability groups, also including local government folks, but also folks who are working at the regional level on climate issues. Um, the conversations varied a little bit, but they all talked a little bit about Dr. Co what they see as Dr. Cog's role in this, as well as what they see as some of the barriers and opportunities. If we go to the next slide, you'll see some bullet points. I'm not going to talk through all of these, but I will just maybe highlight a couple of things related to Dr. Cog's role since you're the board. Um, they talked about you know wanting to make sure this was about guiding folks, not dictating to folks um, what sort of opportunities there are sharing, documenting and sharing best practices, being uh, doing that convening role and facilitation role to look for opportunities for coordination and collaboration, but not anything that would be top down. Um, and then in terms of the climate and housing folks, uh, you know, definitely a lot of uh, conversation around the intersection of where housing goes and what that means in terms of transportation. So how do we support transit in terms of new housing development? Um, and how do we think about our, um, long-term community resilience in terms of where new housing goes. And I think that's the summary of engagement. I'm sorry we're flying through. I'm just trying to keep us on time. Um, I'm going to pause quickly to see if there are any clarifying questions. If there are, please feel free to raise your virtual hand uh, or to put it in the chat. I think everyone knows if you click on the reactions button at the bottom of the screen. Oh, that's not where it is. Oh, maybe it's because I'm a panelist. I think that's where you raise your hand. It's not showing on my screen. Anyway, use the chat if you can't figure out how to raise your hand or unmute and just speak up. It is under reactions. If you click on reactions, there's a raise hand bar at the bottom. Okay, it's not showing up on mine, but it might be because I'm a panelist. I don't know. Anyway. Not the my... arrow, but the button itself, if that helps. Ah, there you go. Okay, well, I'm learning <laughs> myself. Excellent. Okay, Judy. Hi, good evening. I just was just curious. I saw in this that um, we are breaking this out um, as far as like assessing the needs by income category. Are we also doing that in evaluating um, the senior element within those categories because of the 
sometimes transportation and location needs, um, like in relation to medical care and things like that, are more necessary if that's the target group that we're going after and helping? That's um, a, yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Judy. Um, I, yes, we are. So we're contextualizing the housing need across the trends that we're seeing by age groups and age cohorts. So because we're able to have really, really great data from Dr. Cog, data analytics staff using the small area forecasts, we are able to look at forecast housing need by age category. Um, one of the things that we showed in one of our previous slides to the advisory group um, was the sort of generation of millennials becoming seniors through this 2050 period and an even increasing need of housing needs for older adults through 2050 because of the generational changes. So it is something that we're contextualizing and accounting for in the housing needs um, as we're doing it. So we are looking at income. We're not cross-sectioning, you know, below 60% AMI by income, but we are mm -hmm. contextualizing that need across changing demographics, including age. Okay. So sort of thinking about the types of housing, like typically as people you know, no longer have large families in their homes, they can use or they they want to live in smaller um, square footage, that kind of thing. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, once we get, so we have a next phase we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation of barriers and opportunities, um, which start to identify some of those issues and what might those strategies be that, that uh, jurisdictions in the region could think about to meet those needs across um, different age categories or different income categories. Um, so we will be getting there. I will say that some of the focus groups specifically on the climate and sustainability group, we talked a lot about the need for um, older adults to age in their communities and housing uh, needs that reflect that as well. Um, we're also doing the work in Louisville with uh, Rob, and uh, that's something that's come up all really a lot, very, very frequently in our work in Louisville. Yeah, I was just going to say, I know, I think it's I think it's kind of across the region in Colorado, it seems very popular. It's like this, the town you live in, that you've lived for the last 30 years, you'd like to be able to live the next 30, but maybe you're ready to have your house move on to another young family to move into, but there's nowhere for you to go. Yep. That's what we're finding. So yeah, that's, and I think that I hear that in Lafayette, I hear that in um, Superior, you know, I think Boulder's, you know, experiencing some similar problems. So I think that it's probably um, all across Colorado and a good thing for us to be looking at it. I know here we're having a hard time figuring out how do we do that? How do we focus on that population? Because it tends to also be people who don't have as much income at that point coming in. So we need to worry about making it a little bit more affordable for some of those people as well. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I saw a couple other questions, please. Yeah. yeah. I saw a couple of their hands go up, but then maybe went down. So, I you saw my uh, David. Nice to yeah. see you again. Um, and nice I to took see mine you. down because my questions. I think I'm going to save them for later. They're they're more okay. about your approach and methodology. So okay. um, it'll it'll go up again later. Okay, great. Uh, then let's move on to that uh, present part of the presentation. Approach and methodology. Take it away, Tyler. Okay, uh, now we'll get into the fun part, um, talking about the methodology of regional housing needs assessments. Um, one of the things that we wanted to start off here was talking about the differences between this regional housing needs assessment and some of the, that work that's been done at the local level um, that we've talked about. I know there was a mention in the chat to make sure that that y'all are highlighting the work that you're doing at the local level so that folks see all that great work that's being done. Um, so we've sort of broken out how we're seeing the differences and similarities in some of this work. So local housing needs assessment, again, a lot of these needs assessments that have been done as part of the IHOP grant funding, um, these are really sort of, for the most part, point in time looks about what are the trends that are impacting the housing market today or the point in time in which that needs assessment has been done. The time horizon varies in terms of how um, those needs assessments are forecasting that need into the future. So it is kind of a snapshot in time for most of those local housing needs that we've looked at. Um, but it is a little bit, uh, it's, it's really diverse. Some counties or some partnerships at counties are doing their own needs assessments. Some local jurisdictions are doing them. Um, a lot of jurisdictions are working together. We're working with Louisville and Superior to make sure that they're thinking about Marshall Fire Recovery in the same ways across the jurisdictions in Boulder County. So there's lots of different ways that communities are doing this. Um, consolidated plans. So these consolidated plans are um, really focused on more detailed demographic breakdowns for 
federal grant applications for HUD block grants. So CDBG funding, um, other block grant funding, these consolidated plans are a requirement to access that funding. It's really a three to five year planning process or a consolidated plan to think about those housing needs specific to those federal grants, block grants for affordable housing. Um, on this regional housing needs assessment, the thing that you'll see reinforced over the next few slides is that what we're looking at is that current need, that point in time, um, and that accounts for what we call historic underproduction. So that is really important to us to get a really healthy understanding of what future need is, because we don't want to start from a place of um, not accounting for the housing that's not there today that's needed. And so making sure that we're accounting for that underproduction as we also think about future need and forecast need over time, but then also thinking about um, housing needs for the homeless as well. And how does that fit into overall housing needs, um, especially at that lower income category as well. Um, the future need accounts for population growth and demographic change. Some of the things that we were just talking about for um, trends in household incomes, trends in the sort of aging profile across different communities, and really the distribution of these needed units across those incomes. The time horizon that I'll show you that we're looking at is through 2050, so a 28 year forecast really that's aligned with long term sort of comp planning timelines, um, those long term long range planning horizons. And the goal here is really to understand the regional and sub regional what I'll talk about in a minute needs to advance coordinated planning and policy. Um, we do have some questions around sub regional versus thinking about um, local housing targets and what would be most useful for you all and the conversations that you're having at the local level or conversations that you're having with the state legislatures as well during this legislative process. Next slide, please. Um, so some of the guiding principles we came across, we, we defined these guiding principles with Dr. Cog's staff and refined um, with the advisory group, but these guiding principles are to proactively determine housing targets for the region, um, consider sub-regional markets and local conditions. So the sub-regional markets are really, really important across the Denver region. You know, I, I mentioned Louisville and Superior a moment ago, but we can't really look at uh, housing demand in Louisville without thinking about what the implications of jobs and commute patterns are from folks across the region, especially coming from Westminster, coming from Broomfield and coming from those adjacent jurisdictions and how that uh, jobs, housing balance and commute pattern affects housing demand and housing availability in a community. Um, be transparent around data sources, limitations, and methodological choices. Um, again, we want to be extreme, use the best data that's available, the most current data that's available. Sometimes we'll do that at a regional level or a sub-regional level because some of the, the quality of the data sometimes goes down at, at a more granular level. So making sure we're using the best data that we use and then align the, the work that we're doing with the Metro Vision planning areas and goals. So incorporating that regional policy framework into the way that we're thinking about regional housing needs. Um, so steps in defining need, this housing need again, I'm going to sort of drill this in. Um, we've got three components of housing need, calculating the current need, um, which is also we call under production, um, understanding the current need for homelessness. And so one data point that we use here, which is um, not always the best, but is the best data that's available is the point in time data, um, homeless account point in time data. We are working with MDHI to get more accurate data that reflects um, services needed in housing that is searched for by folks um, that's a little bit more current with that throughout the region. So we're working with MDHI to get a little bit more quality data on that homeless need. Um, and then future need. What is the population forecast and how do we think that population forecast is going to play out um, spatially across the region? Um, income targets. So we're taking that overall housing need and getting it down to income levels. How much income do you need at different um, AMI or MFI uh, levels? So um, for reference here, when we talk about AMI, it's area median income. There's actually two AMIs between the Denver region and the Boulder region, as far as HUD is concerned. 100% um, area median income for a family of four in the Denver region in 2023 was $124,000. 100% area median income in Boulder in 2023 for a four-person household was $133,000. And so when we talk about 60% AMI, 80% AMI, it's really that share of 100% AMI depending on household size. Um, for subregions, uh, determine subregional geographies, which we'll go through a little bit about some of the metrics and analysis that we did to define those subregions. And then distribute that total regional need to subregions by uh, unit type um, and income target. So how are household income needs aligned with housing types? How are those housing types related to some of the strategies and the conversations that will ha be happening later in this process? Next slide, please. Um, again, don't want to spend too much time on this, but just a visual representation of the current need thinking through underproduction. 
um, and units to address homelessness and the future need, which is that forecasted projected need over that 28 year planning horizon. Next slide, please. So all of that's to get us to this, what we've been calling the big number, um, which is the regional need through 2050 uh, to address current and future needs across the income spectrum. The Denver region needs to build 511,000 units by 2050. This is a big number across the region, but when we look at it on an annual basis, it is not very far away from regional housing production that's happened over the last eight years. So it is doable. Um, it is consistent with some of the trends that have been happening across the region. The thing that you'll see in a moment is that the needs by income category, however, though, are really different. Um, and there are moderate and, and lower income households need, that are needing housing over this 28-year this, uh, planning period. Next slide, please. So when we do this distribution of housing need um, in the orange portions of the bar, this is the current housing um, across the region by each of these income categories. And then the white is that need through 2050. Um, so this is the distribution of the 511,000 units across these income categories, zero to 60, 60 to 80, 80 to 100%, and 100% and above being more of the market rate housing. But there's housing needed across all income categories in the spectrum over this 20 year period, but a really large amount in this zero to 60% AMI, AMI category and really about 26, 27,000 units in that lower income AMI category for housing for the homeless. So that's a really, really, really important um, part and hard to reach part from a policy and investment standpoint um, for affordable housing specific for housing for the homeless. Next slide, please. Um, so because this 28 year forecast is really long, we wanted to step back and think about what a 10 year forecast makes sense, what a 10 year target makes sense, um, and some of the reasons that we think it would make sense is because a near-term target can help the region start to get on track to meet that 2050 need. It seems a little bit more achievable when you look at a 10-year target versus a 28-year target. Um, it also reduces, reduces the uncertainty of long-term forecasts, right? So we're forecasting with the best information that we have available. There's a lot of uncertainty into what will happen in 28 years. As we all know, over the last five to six years, things can change very quickly. Um, it helps align policy and strategy with current market conditions um, without thinking too far into the future of where those market conditions might be. Um, and current need, it allows us to think about current need being prioritized um, over a shorter time horizon. So how do you think about that underproduction and really housing for the homelessness as the most immediate need into meeting that long-term goal in this 10-year target? Next slide, please. So when we do that, the 10-year target comes down to about 216,000 uh, units, which is that 10-year share of the 28-year forecast. This includes all under production and units to address homelessness sort of up front in that 10 years, and then also 10 years of that future growth accounted for as well. Next slide, please. And so the distribution changes a little bit when we start to do that and say, if we're looking at a 10-year target and really focusing on meeting what is the current need that under production and housing for the homelessness, um, we still have need across all these income categories, um, but again, you see this large need that's still happening in that zero to 60% AMI with the same amount of housing units that are needed for the homeless. Next slide, please. And then we sort of further break that out and the zero to 30% AMI category, we break out a little bit more just to understand what types of housing and in many cases, what types of services need to go along with that housing for folks to be successful in housing in zero to 30% AMI category. Um, but a large share of that zero to 30% in that green, you can see is that housing for the homeless that's needed, needed in that zero to 30% AMI category. In the blue bars across all these income categories is that under production number, that, that current need. And then in the yellow is the unmet future needs. So the forecast need of growth, which is population growth and household formation happening over the next 10 years. David, I think we're gonna pause okay. as quickly yeah. as I can. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of information. Um, any quick clarifying questions? I'm, I'm tempted to just keep keep going through so we can be on time. But if there are some quick questions, I see a couple hands. Let's let's try to do those quickly. Claire, do you want to go first? You said oh, you were going to ask. You. Yeah, 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 I'm happy. Yeah, I think it's, it, Kevin beat me to the raise hand feature, but um... well, you did it even before the presentation, so. <laughs> Yeah, right, right. I pre-raised <laughs> my hand. Um, <laughs> so just a couple of the questions I, I wanted to understand how deeply you're going to drill into you. And I'll just ask them. There are like three of them. Um, I don't, so just for efficiency. One is I think you, you alluded to sub-regions. 
And I'm wondering as you as you consider like population growth, you know, I assume you're also really going to be looking at job growth. Um, and then and what assumptions do you build in around whether um, every community will be providing sufficient housing for every job holder in that community, as David knows very well from his work in Boulder, a city of Boulder has a huge jobs to housing imbalance. Um, and so um, that's been solved by uh, putting the housing burden on adjacent communities. On the other hand, many people would say that that's great because actually we're a two income family and we live equidistant between the, the two jobs. So I'm just wondering how you factor that sort of thing in as people, um, you know, where with the distribution of jobs. So that's one question. Another question is around um, not just units, uh, numbers of units, um, but unit size. Like, are you looking at um, the need for family housing, like two, three bedroom homes versus, um, you know, smaller homes? Like what, what our family composition is? The dem demographers are telling us that we're having smaller families and many people are opting not to have families at all. On the other hand, if we just build to that market, families will be left out um, in terms of having their needs addressed. And then the third, I think, question I would love to hear you talk about is how do you look at the distribution um, of uh, home ownership versus rental? And um, you know, I suppose ideally everybody would love to own a home, but everybody can't, um, be, you know, economically. But but I guess I just I, that's another question of what is what's the goal? Uh, are we trying to build enough product with a range of prices so that everybody that does want to own a home can? Or are we saying in today's economy with housing prices, it's just not realistic and we're just looking at units so that everybody actually has a roof over their head. So those are the three things okay. that I've been noodling on. Okay, so Tyler, three things, job assumptions at the sub-regional level, how are you factoring in unit size of it all? And how are you factoring in tenure, home ownership versus rental? Uh, yes, all great questions, and I could spend hours talking about those. <laughs> I know you could. <laughs> we'll try not. Um, so for the subregions, we'll go through that in a little bit here um, in the next section, as you can see some of the, the inputs that we're using to the subregional model um, that do include uh, job growth, um, both current jobs and future jobs that are forecast across different communities or across different areas. That's one of the reasons that we're using the subregions sort of as this in-between layer, because it allows us to understand that jobs, housing balance and commute patterns um, and that relationship in a way that's really, really helpful for this analysis. So we are accounting for it and we are accounting for it differently for current jobs versus future jobs. Um, on the housing by size thing, um, you know, we will get to housing needs by type um, as part of what we're doing here. And that really starts to then bridge the gap into the strategies a little bit, because a lot of that really is um, policy conversations and policy decisions at the local level about how do you want to meet those needs and what are the um, local conditions in which you want to advance some of those policies. So we will start to have those discussions to lead into the strategy conversation on the distribution of ownership and rental um, we also will be talking about that in the in the final report. One of the sort of main uh, uh, sort of considerations there is the income level. So we know that it's really, really challenging to qualify for a mortgage if you're below 80% AMI to hit the loan to income ratio required for a mortgage, even with a traditional mortgage at 20%. And so there is some component of that household income that allows us to think about 10-year um, in ways that are helpful for forecasting. There's also strategies that we can think about that are that are sometimes challenging, but to lower the barrier for home ownership for more moderate income um, households and moderate income families as well. So I don't wanna sort of limit it to 80% and above because there's other strategies that, that can be advanced to help support more moderate income home ownership. A lot of it sort of depends on what the regional goals are and in many cases, the local goals around home ownership and housing type that's related to programmatic funding in many cases and certainly the regulatory environment and land use decisions to be able to support those sorts of things. So again, a lot of that is gonna, I think, happen in this strategies conversation as well. But we'll have more information in the next section about the subregions and the uh, assumptions into the subregion analysis that we're using. Thank you. Okay, Kevin. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, and I see that uh, Directors Dermella and Odorizio already acknowledged this, but I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, Director Levy asked her questions two and three were exactly the questions I wanted to ask. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing whether you can actually sprinkle or dig down into each of those AMI levels and talk about what are the housing types, housing sizes and types needed in each of those categories. I get very tired on the Denver City Council of, of approving for and even funding, adding funding to projects that are studio and one bedroom apartments. Um, and uh, so uh, thank you, Claire, you asked my questions. Perfect. Deborah. Hi, yeah. I, can you hear me okay? I had my speakers yeah. messed up last time. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Um, I'm kind of concerned with the same questions that were asked, but also to add to those concerns, what we want as a transportation um, a organization is to reduce vehicle usage. And how do we get people to live where they work? And that comes up most clearly in places where you have first responders and other folks who serve our kids and the like and make less than others. And I don't see in the discussion of the AMI numbers being Denver and Boulder, any considerations for South Metro. And we have children and teachers and first responders that wanna work here too. And so what concerns me as an organization as we go into this process is, are we looking at engagement in all regions so that if our policy is gonna to be to promote housing policy, to make things affordable for young people who are beginning their careers and beginning their families and serving our children and communities. Are we also doing that with the mind of the places where they're gonna work so that we can reduce their long commutes? Example, if we have a first responder who has to travel from East Aurora or North Arvada to come serve our children in South Metro, or homes in South Metro, that's not reducing vehicle miles traveled, that's not reducing greenhouse gases. So I'd appreciate understanding as you move into the next section and considering the last section, how we're engaging South Metro equally because there's often a perception that because we don't have homeless, we don't have a problem as much, but we do have people who have needs as demonstrated on your charts, particularly with the unmet needs and the gaps and the underproduction that you anticipate on slides 28 um, and 29, at least in the prep. Um, so that's my big concern. Okay, thanks. I think Tyler, maybe you could speak to that issue as you go through the next part of the presentation. And then Mayor Stark, I want, Sarker, I want to ask, maybe we can hold your question till the end. I'll, I'll cue you up to be first, like I did Claire, um, so so we can get keep moving through the presentation. And then I also, Tyler, uh, will ask you to speak to the question that was in the chat from Nicole and Boulder. But let's go on to the next part of the presentation and come back to those. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks, David. And great questions. Thank you for the questions. Um, so jumping in to talk about the subregions, um, the role of the subregions and um, I mentioned a little bit about the sort of data quality and our ability to look at um, job housing locations and commute sheds and commute patterns in in determining housing need and in in matching that housing need relative to where um, job growth is happening because really it is employment growth that is the driver of in migration and household formation outside of um, natural births that are happening for population. So the job growth piece is really important from a policy perspective, matching up housing needs by job growth and reducing that VMT that's consistent with Metro Vision is also part of the sort of policy framework that we're baking into thinking about the subregions. Um, from an analytical standpoint, the quality and consistency of the data at some of these subregions, um, we're using uh, geographies that are called PUMAs. They're, it's it's PUMS, called PUMS data, it's census data that we're able to cross tabulate a lot of things in a lot more detailed way that are statistically significant that we just can't do at a local level. So it's one of the reasons that we really like using these sub-regional geographies 
And we're able to replicate that across the subregions and then think about even how to do that at the local level um, and use the same regional framework to sort of think about targets at the local level. Um, from an equi equity perspective, um, information and specificity um, is just not, again, not available at the local level. One aspect that we're going to be bringing into this is thinking about um, racial equity and um, uh, historically disparate impacts on communities of color, specifically related to housing costs. And so being able to look at uh, cost burdening by race and ethnicity is data that we can look at at the sub-regional level, but is really a lot more challenging to do at the local level, um, given some of the data quality issues. So it's a way for us to think about equity and integrate equity into our analysis as well. Um, ability to operationalize regional goals. Um, you'll see in here that we do have current and future transit and transportation investments in the region that are accounted for in the way that we're thinking about the sub-regional targets um, to bring that policy and that transportation um, housing job um, a mix into the, the analysis that we're doing. And then tailored approaches uh, to areas with different conditions and the strategy piece. And when you see the um, subregions, I do think it's really helpful because um, you all as elected officials within your local jurisdictions are you know, working within your local jurisdictions, but you have neighbors and you and your neighbors are part of the same subregional housing market. And a decision that um, you know, Arvada makes does impact what happens in Golden, does impact what happens in Westminster. And so thinking about the relationship between those jurisdictions um, and the strategy is really helpful at the sub-regional level. Next slide, please. Um, so these are the sub-regional geographies that we come up that we've come up with, and, and we've gone through a lot of iterations with Dr. Cog, technical staff, um, and the advisory group to help inform uh, how we got to this place. But two of the biggest things that we're trying to maintain here is uh, contiguous geographies, um, knowing that it's important uh, from a policy perspective to be able to see the relationships between neighboring jurisdictions and subregions, and then linking the census data and commute patterns, again, to account for this um, sometimes um, efficiency in job and housing location, and sometimes inefficiency in job housing location, which is requiring additional travel across the region. Um, to access jobs or to qualify for housing that's affordable to those uh, household income earners um, with those wages. So it does allow us to do that that uh, sort of commute pattern based on jobs, wages, and housing affordability as well. Next slide, please. Um, and then to get to some of the questions that came up in that in the last section, we're looking at a number of attributes uh, to calculate the subregional share. So we've developed a model to distribute the total regional need between the sub uh, regions based on the criteria here that capture current conditions, future trends, and some of the regional planning priorities and policies. So, um, you know, we're looking at current population and future population. Where's current population? Where are we likely to see future population? Um, on the sustainability side, looking at current transit, looking at future transit, looking at the regional center designations within MetroVision, um, commute duration, all of this information to help inform how we're thinking about um, housing needs relative to job locations. On the housing side, um, the amount of affordable units within um, different jurisdictions or different subregions across across the Denver region. Um, that this tenure piece, owner versus rental housing. Where do we have more rental housing that's affordable? Where do we have more ownership housing that's affordable? Um, and then vacancy rates. So vacancy rates are really important because that is really a for us a function of 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 demand and supply. If we're seeing higher vacancy rates, then there's something happening where there's production that's happening to meet that demand. If we're seeing extremely low vacancy rates, it means that we're probably not seeing production that's meeting that demand that exists within that subregion. So vacancy rates are also really important. And then on the employment side, um, that's this current jobs and future jobs piece. Again, um, because Dr. Cog, Dr. Cog has really great data through the small area forecast, not all regions have the quality of data that Dr. Cog has or the technical expertise at the staff level. Um, we are able to have really good data to be able to understand where it's most likely that those jobs will occur. Um, of course, you know, longer term, there is this question around economic growth and job growth related to housing affordability in the Denver region, which is a big question. Um, and I think it's really important to think about housing production and affordability across all these income levels um, with the goal of, of job creation and long term job growth and prosperity across the region as well. Um, the other sort of thing that we have that we're looking at is sort of equity. Uh, component across all of the analysis that we're doing, but thinking about the historic impact of ex exclusionary policies and disparate incomes. Um, some of this is housing policy. Some of this is federal lending standards. Um, a lot of this are just sort of institutional practices that are baked into policies and the way that the housing market functions, but understanding how those uh, historic policies have created conditions 
that disparately impact uh, specifically communities of color. Next slide, please. And David, we're gonna go into the next section real quick, which is opportunities and barriers. So this is our next phase of our work that we're looking into um, to really tee up the strategies conversation. So some of the factors that we're looking at affecting housing production, you know, policies, practices, and conditions, they really affect how much and what kinds of housing gets built within the region, both positively and negatively. Um, we've looked at a lot of development trends across the, the jurisdictions, the governments in the region, um, and a lot have seen a lot of housing production, and some haven't seen as much housing production. So those, those policies and practices and market conditions really impact what happens at the sub-regional level and the local level. Things like uh, land use designation, zoning, uh, development procedures and processes, taxation, development centers, all these other components that you all are very familiar with in your day-to-day uh, -day lives as, as council members and decision makers. Um, continued engagement with regional stakeholders to help identify and prioritize key barriers. We're going to have continued conversations with um, folks through focus groups and stakeholder interviews in our advisory groups. We're having constant communication. Our advisory group is super, super great, really great representation from various aspects of the housing industry and the housing community across the region. Really, really great to have them participate in this as well. Um, and then consider the role that systemic barriers and opportunities play in the context of housing needs identified in the regional housing needs assessment. Next slide, please, David. Um, and so one of the things that we want to sort of tee up is this question of our local goals and effective planning tool. So we will be sharing with the advisory group and, and ultimately with you all, our sub-regional uh, targets, um, running through this model that I just went through, you know, taking the 511,000, the 216,000 number and figuring out that distribution at the sub-regional level. Um, would it be helpful in having these goals uh, at the local level so that you can think about what your housing needs are and have that consistency across jurisdictions and coordination with Dr. Cog, who's helping to convene these conversations? We have found, and I think the, the Compass example is a really good one, um, that they are helpful in identifying more specific regional barriers and opportunities and understand the degree to which housing challenges vary across local jurisdictions. You know, all of the communities across the Denver region are very, very different, very diverse, and the strategies to address your housing needs are going to be very different. So making sure that you have the most uh, available information to help inform those decisions as part of the strategy is something that we want to be able to support you with. And I know that Dr. Cog is really, really um, focused in on a, of providing service to member governments as part of this work. Um, it's a good way of aligning local goals and strategies with that regional and sub-regional market dynamics as well. Um, more effectively implement the regional strategy that is context sensitive, um, and then also helping to recognize the shared roles in addressing regional housing needs and how strategies can be deployed in ways that reflect the uniqueness of the communities across the region. So, David, with that, we'll okay, about, and then the conversation. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, just quickly, after today, uh, Tyler and his team are not sleeping for the next two weeks because they need to finish this work to present it uh, to the advisory group. And exactly, I think two weeks from today. Um, and yeah, there's it, as you can see, there's a lot to cover. Um, I, Tyler, I'm just going to ask a couple questions from the chat, and then I want to hand it back to the chair. Um, Quickly, does the methodology account for immigration? The question was in the chat related to documented and undocumented immigration. Does it factor that in? It does in the way. So we've, you know, the Dr. Cog technical team has aligned their forecast with the state demographer, um, and they do account for immigration, uh, looking backwards at trends and forecasting that out as well. So it does account for immigration, you know, natural household growth from employment growth, and then um, population, you know, that natural increase in population from births over deaths, and as the population changes over time, that may shift as well through, through that natural natural population impacting overall uh, population growth. And the next one, which there was a second for, is how do you account for the availability of land for housing, understanding some, some communities, all new development is redevelopment, it's infill, and other communities have green fields, so it's easier to build, less expensive to build. How does the model account for that? Uh, in very complex ways between how Dr. Cog staff looks at it through the small area forecast and land capacity through that small area forecast and um, through our our sort of priorities in the sub-regional um, goals that we went through that sort of circle diagram. Um, if there's a housing need and there's no land capacity, that doesn't mean that you don't have a housing need. Um, you know, it, there are policy decisions that can be made to help support and meet that need. 
Um, and those are policy decisions. So we're we're hoping to hoping to get there. Just because there's not you know vacant land capacity doesn't mean that there's not housing need. And going from that housing need to strategies will be that sort of again that next phase of this work. Great, thank you, thank you everybody for your patience. So we're a bit over time. I'm going to pass it back to the chair, Chair Shaw, and I'll just call out that I did not get back to Mayor Starker, who had this hand raised earlier, but you that's, can decide what you want to do with that. Absolutely. No, I think that's great. Director Starker, if you would like to start out. Thank you very much. And an interesting uh, presentation. Uh, you spoke to my question, which was really how would how might we address the cost of development? Uh, you know, land, labor, material fees, financing. The time it, it takes to develop a, a project and get it onto the market. Uh, also, in connection with that, looking at different uh, types of housing to, to, to develop, you know, uh, modular housing, but but uh, different housing types that you could develop. And then third, uh, I put in a plug for developing and continuing to develop a skilled labor force that's uh, for our construction needs, because uh, that will affect the cost of construction and the timing that we can deliver it. So uh, uh, nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. You know, it's, it is also interesting, I think, um, in this presentation that there are so many variables, uh, a lot that Dr. Cog takes into account and, and uh, the state demographer, but you have a lot of uh, balls in the air trying to juggle, uh, you know, where the where the commute's going to go and and how do we serve the need around those points. So I I too appreciated the presentation. Um, so if there are discussion points uh, in addition to what we've had, uh, please raise raise your virtual hands. Uh, Director Mulvey, thank you. I have one additional point that I put in the chat, and it, I wonder, as you talk about different housing types and as we're raised by uh, other directors, do we think about, and is it part of the consideration, the impact of construction defect litigation, which has really reduced the ability of uh, builders to do condominiums, which are used to be very affordable, um, and whether or not that uh, affordability of build, as Mayor Starker mentioned, is a factor in how legislation can impact that if we um, made the cost of construction and the cost of litigation less. Um, yeah, the in most, I, I can't think about a regional housing strategy or a statewide housing strategy that we've done that hasn't identified construction defect litigation as an opportunity to increase production, especially for home ownership and more moderate income home ownership, especially as you think about other housing types that are ownership that aren't large lot detached single dwelling development. Um, so it is almost always part of the sort of toolkit of options that are available and identified as part of these projects. And it's an important one too. In Washington, we worked with the state of Washington to help change legislation at the state around construction defect litigation that's starting to play out in the insurance rates. And we are starting to see some developers that are seeing reduced costs because of that. It's gonna take a little bit longer for that to fully play out, but the insurers are are have, have adjusted how they think about the risk profile for condo development in a ways that is happening a little bit faster than we thought it would, to be honest, which is great. Great. Uh, Director Odoricio. Sorry, I had to. All right, I have a question. Um, as we move forward, I understand that this is not fully baked, our uh, assessment our, in our study, and we've got some work to do to still kind of take it through the rest of the finish line. Nevertheless, um, I'm very concerned about the upcoming legislative uh, session. Uh, it, we have found that sometimes um, legislators, uh, th first of all, they don't get elected by doing nothing. And they have uh, different perspectives of how local governments are either not doing enough or not doing it correctly. And so what I'm concerned about is, are there some things that we can do as a collective in Dr. Cog to ask people to say, hold off on certain types of legislation until we get 
uh, things done uh, on this effort and maybe even show them the kind of work that we're doing, the analysis that we're doing. And so I guess if you want to specify the questions that I'm trying to ask is number one, what can our message be to legislators to say, hold off instead of trying to um, put together a bunch of legislation that might be solved with our effort here? Uh, and then also, what are some of the things that could really screw us up if they start mucking with it uh, over the next couple months that could interfere or limit our options in being able to use this analysis to move the ball down the field? A very good point. I, um, especially to the pitfalls, um, Tyler, maybe you have some ideas on things that uh, the state could do that would totally derail us from trying to get to the right place. Um, you know, I, I, I'm hesitant to speak about the politics of the state legislature specifically in Colorado. What I can talk about is, is I think how I've seen this play out in other states with regions and communities that have been doing this work. Um, and I do think it's really helpful to continue to move forward and to try to get this as far along as possible so that, you know, you are showing that progress and trying to understand and meet that need, um, you know, moving into the, the barriers and opportunities, having that conversation, figuring out what a toolkit of strategies are and what some of those strategies might be most appropriate in your community. Um, and this whole process, I do think, is is really helpful uh, as part of that. Um, I think one of the questions that that we want to ask, too, as part of this is, what out of this process would be helpful for you to have those conversations um, with the legislatures or to understand at your local level what is the most helpful information for you to have those conversations too? And I know Director Rex probably has uh, some comments here as well, but I think you know we we want to be helpful for you to be able to have those conversations. And I know um, that's what we'd we'd love to hear from you as part of this too. Claire, I know you, you got your hand up. Let me just finish one thing. Let me clarify, if I might. Thank you, Claire. Um, I guess what I'm also asking for is not what should we ask the legislator, legislature to not do. Uh, help us in the final report specifically identify what we can ask the legislature to do because they're not going to sit back and do nothing. They need to take credit for moving the ball down the field on some of these issues of uh, efficiency, which I equate to some of the, the environmental things, you know, urban sprawl, the efficiency, density, this all comes together. And so I guess I'm going to ask that the report specifically lay out some sort of strategy, because whether you want to weigh in or not on the legislative stuff, it defines uh, the boundaries of our success and options and opportunities. And so if we can get some support from this report that says, ask the legislature to do this, ask them not to do this, that helps us. Because if we have another report that we can't use to further our strategy at the legislature, then it's not going to do anything. And we're going to be back to what we've been doing for the last few years, playing defense on legislative ideas. And I will say that the best way to beat and overcome crappy ideas is to come up with better ones. And especially because the legislature justifiably is saying the status quo won't work. So we need as local governments to stop saying that idea sucks. We need to say, here's a better one. And if we can use this report to do that, then we have things to ask the legislature sure. for support on. And positive redirection might be uh, our new method of getting things done the right way at local governments, because sitting back and reacting is killing us. And Director Rex, um, if you don't, don't mind, Director Levy. Well, Director Rex, did you have something you wanted to say in response to, I think, something um, that Tyler was saying a little bit ago? I, I can hold that I question. Did. I did, Director Levy, if I may. If, if Tyler's looking to call a friend, I'd pick up the phone. I uh, I am, um, and I appreciate everything that Director Odoricio said, and, and we've had several conversations about this, right? And I think... You know, my message to the legislature with regards to, you know, what we're doing in this regional housing assessment right now is that, you know, they've already expressed the importance of doing planning and assessments, right? I mean, you know, one of the areas of emphasis, there's the strategic growth uh, emphasis area, which is all about planning and assessments, right? Then they talk about the TOC stuff, which I'm happy to give an update to folks if we have time. And then the ADU section, right? So with the, you know, philosophically, some of the issues that I'm trying to 
just through my own head trying to figure out with the TOC bill is that it's transactional, right? It's it's a, it's a mitigation strategy without fully understanding the context of the problem that we have in the region, which I think is why the assessment portion of this is so, so important. Now, I understand, you know, the politics associated with this and, and uh, trying to get stuff moving. But, um, you know, I think if we can get to a point with this assessment, which the next stage of this is looking at the opportunities and barriers that and barriers that exist that the legislature can really help local governments in addressing right i mean that is the conversation which i'm interested in having with the with the with the legislature um you know listen we're the timing is not perfect on this i think you know with you know the in a in a month or so we'll have a better understanding of some of those opportunities and barriers and we can you know, we'll fully engage the legislature as we go forward in this and get new information. Um, but again, yeah, the timing's not perfect. But but Director Odoricio is 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 perfectly right. It's you know, it's about we got to provide options for you know, unless we provide some some better alternatives, then you know that's what the answer is going to be from them. It's like, well, you know, if you don't have any other option and an alternative solution, then you know, we can't really have a conversation. So I get that. And it's, it keeps me up at night for sure. <laughs> thank you. And Director Levy, thank you for your patience. You have the oh, floor. Of course. No, I think what, what uh, Director Rex said was very important and, and, um, and uh, Director Odoricio as well, because I, I have a different comment or question that I wanted to ask, but um, I've been sitting in on the on the TOC stakeholder meetings along with Director Rex, and and it it um, it doesn't encourage a regional approach. So um, it's you know every jurisdiction you know that meets these criteria has to do these things, um, and that may not be the best approach to solving the need. So, but the uh, I guess another question observation sort of along in the similar vein to. Um, to some of my earlier questions about how we're analyzing the need, um, you know, we always, uh, and, and it goes to the the spatial separation of jobs and housing often, where the more people drive to qualify, as as we used to say, um, then their transportation costs go up. So when we look at affordability, are you factoring in, you know, that maybe maybe you're able to keep your housing costs under 30% of your income, um, although I don't know anybody that's able to do that anymore, but then your, your transportation costs are so much that that's consuming, you know, 50 or 60% jobs and, and transportation. So how do you look at that as you look at what we need to do to address these barriers? Um, and and I you know I, I I think that there is potential in this TOC legislation, um, or maybe in the strategic priorities legislation, if we can be patient and and come in a problem solving mode to you know to really try to bring down those housing costs by bringing down transportation costs by location efficiency. So I guess I just wonder how you all, Tyler, David, um, Sheila, how you would look at those issues. Within the, I'll answer it from the analysis itself. Um, I think as a starting place, um, and I'm referencing our technical documentation to be able to answer that right now. Um, we are weighting transit access pretty heavily um, in the way that we're thinking about that sub-regional targets. And I think it's really important because you know, number one, there's the, the climate and the transit access piece and the affordability related to transit. But number two, the region's made significant investments in transit. And being able to leverage that investment in transit is an important uh, sort of future, future proofing need to be able to leverage that um, for housing growth in the region. So we are accounting for that and weighting areas with transit access and transit station areas. Um, and also doing that with the future population too. So with the planned uh, regional transit investments, making sure that we're accounting for that and weighting that with the sub-regional targets as well. So on that jobs housing side, we are looking at, you know, employment, we're looking at population, we're weighting transportation, both current and future. Um, and we are also looking at affordability. And it's a sort of negative weight on affordability, where if you don't have a lot of affordable housing and you have high housing costs, but you have lots of job opportunity, you probably should think about some affordable housing or, or affordable housing across a spectrum of income categories. 
And so there is all of those components that we went through in that circle diagram are integrated into having that policy reflected in the analysis that we're doing. And as we've gone through multiple iterations internally with the Dr. Cog team, um, with Sheila and the, the data analytics team and Chris, um, they're looking really good, I will say. And as we work towards refining these, moving into our next advisory group meeting in two weeks, they're making a lot of sense uh, as we review them and continue to refine them too. So I hope that we get to a place where you can see that um, sort of vision and those policy priorities reflected in the sub-regional targets or sub-regional goals that we'll be identifying because um, we feel pretty good about the direction that it's going right now. I wish I could share more with you, but we've still got work to do before that advisory group meeting in a couple of weeks. Great. And that's positive if you're indicating you're seeing solutions. <laughs> Director Dyack. And you're on mute, John. Thank you. Thank you, Wynn. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to further Director Odoricio's, um, you know, thought process. Strategies are great. Um, with strategies come um, come direct thoughts, and and with that come potential not mandates but suggestions. Uh, those suggestions might be uh, might come with costs, and um, I'm I'm real interested since we're we're asking the moon of you guys um, if if a strategy is is identified or uncovered. Um, I would be interested in in what the what the potential cost would be to to get to that logical strategic uh, conclusion or to move the needle. Um, you know, I, I I want if if there are if there's um, funding out there that's already in place, great. Um, but you know, part of part of this uh, that we have in this political elected life is we just we try to find some existing and maybe potentially redirect or reuse. And I think there's an unintended consequence there. So, you know, I'd be interested in uh, if there is a strategy, um, there's usually a cost with that. Where is the genesis of, of that funding coming from? And if if there's no funding out there um, for that, um, what what do we have to do to kind of get there? Because I think that's the big, the big issue is um, we can identify strategies, but there's going to be a significant uh, cost to moving the needle on this. And I just want to make sure that we have something in hand to say, this isn't going to be um, an easy feat. This is going to be very, very challenging. And here's what we believe the cost would be. Where's this money coming from? And and how do we um, partner with the state or with federal or I, I, or other people to uh, to get this? Because I think that creates a crystallization of what we're up against and um, I think that's important. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, that's a very good point that uh, depending on how much uh, housing that we feel should be um, made affordable rather than market rate, where market rate won't satisfy the need, how much more state funding or federal funding do we need uh, to to bring that to fruition. I mean, if not all projects can be approved because of lack of funding, how how does this even happen? Um, so I I think that's definitely a consideration and um, interesting. I know we're coming close to our time to adjourn, but if there are any questions, uh. This would be the last one. <laughs> uh, Executive Director Rex, do you want to go first? And then Director Kondo? Madam Chair, I'll defer to Director Kondo first. I just I just if there was time at the end, I want to provide a quick update on the on the transit oriented communities bill. Thank you. Director Kondo? Yeah, I just wanted to make a statement, uh, I suppose, and you know that is the the issue of the lack of housing stock available. And when you go back and you look at the mortgage crisis in two thousand eight, you know a lot of builders stopped building houses, and all those people that did that who were in the trades, whether they're plumbers, electricians, carpenters, they all found other jobs, 
and now we're trying to play catch up. I, I think we're more than a million units of housing uh, in the hole or behind. And so part of this problem, you know, it's kind of like a system of systems, if you will. Part of the problem is how do you, how do you get more people who have the skills and the trade to be able to build these units that we think we need? And so I, I would ask this group to also think about that too. I mean, there's, there's policy issues around that, um, trying to build some incentives so that you can get people, the labor force, um, to be able to build these additional houses. Absolutely. And, and thinking that uh, the housing crisis is national, that if we're looking at our subregions, you know, maybe, maybe uh, Colorado and Wyoming and Utah and, uh, you know, some of the neighboring states should be looked at so as subregions as well. So I, I don't know if that's as practical a solution because they're so uh, far apart, but uh, either in development of the workforce or de delivery of product. Uh, Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Madam Chairman, very much. And, and unless there's any other questions, I, I have got a couple texts to provide a quick update on um, primarily the transit-oriented communities bill, because that's the one with the most heat right now where we've been engaged. And I want to say right from the outset that we're so appreciative of the outreach um, from the governor's office, as well as the, the sponsors of this bill. Um, we've been meeting regular to have conversations about this, looking at the various aspects of the bill. And I think they've been very responsive to, to some of the comments that we've had. Um, I, you know, for those that remember, the, the governor's staff came and, and gave a presentation to you all um, at the November, I believe it was the November board work session about the, uh, the transit-oriented communities bill, as well as um, the ADU bill and the, the strategic growth bill. Um, but I'm gonna focus primarily on the TOC bill that because that seems to be the one that's furthest along. But basically the bill itself, um, if you recall, um, is really would affect those communities that are, that are considered to be um, transit-oriented communities. And that basically are, are those communities within the five MPOs across the state, of course, Dr. Cog being one, um, that is you know, over a thousand in population. Um, but ultimately it, uh, they have within their jurisdiction or um, a, tra a transit station, or your boundary touches a half a mile radius around that station, or a quarter mile radius around um, a bus rapid transit corridor, or that you have a uh, bus service in your community of fi 15 minutes or less uh, frequency of, of, a, of a route. Um, those, if you do have one of those, then you fall within this de definition of a, of a transit oriented community. And if you do fall in that, uh, that definition, then you are responsible for um, uh, um, attaining what they call a housing opportunity goal. And we don't have time for me to get into exactly what that means right now, but basically it's based on uh, densities around those uh, specific infrastructure. Um, for, uh, the, uh, obviously it's a housing goal. The conversation that we had at the last meeting um, result, re revolved around um, accountability. So if you're unable if a community is unable to meet the housing opportunity goal, what happens, right? So there are um, incentives that are are born in this draft piece of legislation that there's there's an infrastructure fund that's established for communities to help with infrastructure costs to ultimately get some housing units built within your, your, your communities. Um, the, the last meeting, they talked specifically about the accountability or the kind of the stick part of this and what is being suggested at least now is that if you're unable to meet your housing opportunity goal, then um, um, highway users trust fund monies that the community receives would be restricted and diverted to uh, fund in part this infrastructure grant fund. Um, so as you can imagine, we have some concerns with that. Um, and uh, it wasn't only us, obviously CML, CCI, uh, other, other of your your community associations also express some concerns, and you know we're we're trying to get a better handle. We're going to be reaching out to your staffs just to get a better understanding of how they utilize the highway trust fund money. I think anecdotally, we believe that they they use that money primarily for maintenance and safety projects within your communities. 
So we would just want to get a better handle on exactly what that looks like and and um, and how this piece of legislation might affect your local community. So I just wanted to share that with you all. Um, we'll have a more robust conversation about this at the January 17th meeting. Be sure of that. Um, but uh, with the legislature starting back on January 10th, as you know. So anyway, Madam Chair, I'm going to yield back another minute <laughs> so, so <laughs> you can close her down. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, before we close, um, I, I was remiss in not welcoming uh, our new member from Commerce City, uh, Mayor Steve Douglas. So uh, welcome, Steve. Um, are there other matters from members? Hearing none, uh, our next board work session is scheduled for February 7th. And our next board meeting is in person on January 13th. I look forward to seeing all of you there. It is 529 and we are adjourned. Thank you for today's discussion. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Happy New Year. Thank, Thank you. you.